Good evening. How do you make a game scary and fun? There's so many fun games and there's so many scary games, but in my experience, those two things rarely intersect. Five Nights at Freddy's is scary, I guess. At least I found it to be when I was a kid, but it's really not very fun or replayable. Same deal with other classic horror games like Slender the Arrival. They're really just not the most mechanically interesting or satisfying, at least in my opinion. But what happens when a game manages to hit that balance just right? What happens when a game is capable of deeply unnerving the player, but also keeps them craving more and feeling like a real badass? Uh, it's pretty cool. This video is about afraid of monsters. Every single guy on YouTube ever has already done a video about Cry of Fear, okay? Chances are you already know that game and its weird voice acting. You've heard about how crazy good it looks for a Half-Life mod. Hell, you might even know about the unlockable Hello Kitty jacket in it. But when I was growing up, there was another crazy Half-Life horror mod that I remember liking a whole lot more. And the funniest part? It was made by the same guy. In fact, not only was it made by the same guy, it was made by the same guy five years prior when he was only 16. And despite the fact that this game was massively popular on YouTube at the time, getting played by all the big dogs like Markiplier and PewDiePie, after Cry of Fear came out, everyone seems to have just flat out forgotten about Afraid of Monsters. And I think that sucks. Because, call it bias because I played it first, or me being a contrarian looking for attention, I think Afraid of Monsters is awesome, and I honestly prefer it to Cry of Fear in almost every way. Now, this video isn't going to be me trying to tear down Cry of Fear. I do enjoy that game, and I respect the time its team poured into it. It definitely has a place in the Internet Hall of Fame. This video is instead going to be me revisiting a classic game that served as one of the most formative experiences of my life and childhood, but that everyone else online seems to have completely forgotten, and trying to recapture and bring that magic to you all in a way that hopefully helps you guys understand why Afraid of Monsters is so special to me. So, let's start from the top. Afraid of Monsters is a free FPS horror game built from the original Half-Life. Well, it's actually two horror games, technically. The original Afraid of Monsters was created solely by a Swedish guy named Andreas Ronberg, also known as Rumpel. He started on it when he was just 14 years old, and released it in 2005 at the age of 16. Rumpel then remastered and re-released the game two years later on Halloween 2007 as what he calls the Director's Cut version, which he had a tad bit more help with, but from what I can tell, this was still largely a one-man operation. The original version is definitely impressive for being made by a single literal child, and I know there are some people who still find the original to be a ton of fun, but the remaster, Afraid of Monsters Director's Cut, is the one I grew up on and love, so that's the one I'll be talking about for most of this video. By the way, both of these games are so fucking old that they're designed to be played in 4-3 resolution, and if you play them any other way you'll get these weird looking black bars showing up in cutscenes. For your sake, I'll be fixing these in post for the rest of the video. Anyways, let's talk a little about our protagonist character here. I find him to be really interesting. He's a mysterious and seriously badass Swedish guy named David Leatherhoff, which according to Rumpel was a name given to him by his brother that he deeply regrets using because he had no idea that an American celebrity named David Hasselhoff already existed and would make his depressed maniac character the brunt of countless jokes about the similarity. But personally, I like the name David Leatherhoff even despite this funny coincidence. It's a cool, unique name that I've never forgotten and reminds me of the classic horror character Leatherface, which ties perfectly into the game's spooky tone. Anyways, David looks like this, and his model is literally just a retextured Gordon Freeman. Despite that, I find his design really memorable, and I think it stands out on its own. Simon from Cry of Fear has a gray hoodie and, like, a purse or something, but our friend David here is dripped the fuck out in what looks like striped Adidas track pants and a cool matching hoodie. One thing I never see anyone mention online is what the writing on this hoodie actually means. E means Emma, A means Andreas, 4 means 4, and 5 means the fifth letter in the alphabet, which is E, and E stands for ever. So basically, it's Emma plus Andreas for ever. It's a bit gay, but yeah. And by the way, Emma is my girlfriend. To me, this really shows how personal the project was to Rumpel. Even if Simon is the character he literally modeled after his real life face, it feels to me like he put more of his heart into the creation of David. Another thing you should know about David is that he is a bit of an addict, and that brings me to the game's story. The story to Afraid of Monsters is that our friend David here has gotten hooked on this specific brand of pills that keep mysteriously appearing in his mailbox every week, and they've recently been giving him terrifying, violent night terrors. It eventually gets so bad that he can't take it anymore, so he goes to his local hospital to check himself in for rehab. However, he goes to take a quick bathroom break on the way in, and winds up finding more of those same pills sitting on the sink. Against his better judgment, he pops a few and blacks out in a nearby stall. 
This is where the game actually begins. When David regains consciousness, he finds himself in a nightmare world that you and him will be stuck in for the rest of the game. Things in this world are nonsensical, abstract, and maybe just a little bit spooky. Eventually, David does wind up back in the hospital bathroom again, but the entire building is empty, abandoned, and shrouded in darkness. The only signs of human life are these terrifying monsters that twitch and lurk in the shadows. His nightmare is far from over. In fact, it's only just begun. The rest of the game follows David as he tries to escape this terrifying nightmare world he's become trapped in, fighting monsters in a twisted version of his hometown, and trying to stay alive. Sounds simple enough, right? Well, the first thing you'll notice if you choose to play Afraid of Monsters is that the game has an absolutely phenomenal atmosphere. Every inch of this game has been lovingly crafted with custom textures. No drag and drop stock Unity asset bullshit here. It's either a heavily modified Half-Life asset, a piece of furniture made out of in-game brush blocks, or it's completely custom. There's not a single area in this game that isn't moody as hell and fucking creepy. Even the more comical elements of the game, like this weird square flesh monster, are still kind of unnerving to me. This is all helped by the fact that the setting itself is kind of interesting on its own. Afraid of Monsters is set in Markland, which is a fictional town in Rumpel's motherland of Sweden. Cry of Fear later gave us a much more realistic looking rendition of Sweden, but the one in this game is a lot blockier and more surreal looking, being limited by not only the gold source engine, but also the inexperienced mind of a teenager. All of these factors come together to create what I think are some very memorable levels and environments. One other key element to the game's atmosphere is its music. With a few exceptions, most of the tracks used in this game are by Aphex Twin, and while they're not exactly original, they fit the dreary, surreal theme of the game absolutely perfectly, and it's clear that the songs were handpicked by Rumpel to really match the emotions he wanted the player to feel at each part of the game, which is a level of care that most Half-Life mods simply don't have. Next up, I want to talk a little bit more about the game's levels themselves, though that's kind of easier said than done since this game is somewhat non-linear. There's a point where the game forks off in three directions that will take you to three different endings, and depending on which path you take, you'll experience certain levels at different points in your playthrough, and some paths require more backtracking than others. There's also a good amount of optional areas, and even after playing through each ending multiple times, I'm still not entirely sure that I've seen everything this game has to offer. But let's just start from the beginning. Markland Hospital. One of the most common complaints I hear about Afraid of Monsters is that the intro sequence in the hospital is kind of long and sucks to replay. Which yeah, fair enough. But I actually like that it shows you the world outside of David's hallucinations, and gives a point of reference for how much of a nightmare the rest of the game will be. This part also does a really good job of illustrating one of my favorite things about Afraid of Monsters, which is just how much it does to keep the player on their toes and spook them. And I don't mean just jump scares, though this game does have a fair share of those. It starts off really subtle. The hospital is poorly lit, tons of doors are locked, and you'll occasionally hear some weird noises while you're exploring. You'll eventually get your hands on a kitchen knife that'll make you feel a little bit safer, but then you'll pass by a body under wraps on your way to bust these boxes, just to turn around and see it's run off somewhere while you weren't looking. Or how about seeing this banana girl on a painting, and once you track back, she'll be missing from the portrait which has now fallen to the floor. These are just a few examples of the small things this game does to fuck with you and make you feel like you're going crazy. Markland Hospital is a truly bleak and eerie place, even with the lights on. Hell, it didn't even look particularly joyous in the intro sequence set in the real world, but visiting it in David's nightmare with this abundance of locked doors and furniture blockades trapping you in makes it feel downright insidious. And once you find this note from a janitor asking you to cut the building's power and the game hands you a pistol, that's when shit gets real. Markland Hospital is a great location and a great introduction to the game, though the first area can be kind of easy to get lost in, and I don't blame anyone who cracks and looks up a walkthrough to beat it. Ultimately though, I think it does a great job of springing the game's plot into action and setting the tone for the rest of David's trip. And speaking of his trip, next I want to talk about the more surreal elements of this game, which I'll call, for lack of a better term, dream sequences. These parts where you have to follow the red dots or fall to your death were one of the most unique horror set pieces I had ever seen. I say were because a few months ago I played the original Max Payne for the first time and realized they were maybe probably copied directly from that. Both are action games about badass pill addicts tripping the fuck out made by European people a few years apart. The similarities are pretty striking, I can't lie. But even putting that to the side, these areas are very cool and do a good job of making the player feel lost and afraid. There's even a part later on where you return to the red dots again and the game suddenly reveals the platform you're standing on, which makes balancing along it all the more nerve-wracking. And these black and white areas, affectionately dubbed MS Paint from Hell, are still very unique and memorable to me. They really just feel like a whole other world, especially with these twitching trees and the occasional weird silhouette on the wall. Overall, I'd say these dream sequences are the heart of the game's surreal horror. I've seen them inspire levels in other games like TF2, and most fan art of Afraid of Monsters seems to reference them in one way or another. So I think it's probably safe to say they're one of the most 
most memorable things about this game, even if they're not as original as they seem when I was a kid. Moving on though, David's nightmare does eventually become a little bit more grounded in reality. He'll find himself in parking garages, city streets, and canals, and even these more mundane locations manage to have some real highlights. Like when you walk into this empty train station and it looks safe enough. Since no one's looking, you hop over the stall and keep walking, until all the lights slowly shut off around you, and after a brief moment of confusion, a bunch of gates open and you're ambushed by a ton of enemies. It's one of the most pants shitting moments in the entire game, and it also leads to that part where you're faced with three different paths leading to three different endings. Regardless of which path you choose, David eventually finds himself in a residential part of town ransacking houses and apartments. And these places actually have a pretty awesome amount of detail for a Half-Life 1 mod. Sometimes if you see a room and think, fuck, that's dark, I'm not going in there, you can actually just turn on a light switch and hey, that's a lot more welcoming actually. And these houses you visit are also kind of time capsules of the era this mod was created in. You'll find retro looking PCs and old stereo systems, which made me feel really nostalgic coming back to the game after all these years. I also find that it's at this part of the game that it really starts to set in that everyone else in the town has abruptly disappeared and been replaced by these monsters you're fighting. Exploring this part of the game is just great fun. I don't really have much else to say about it. Then we get to the countryside and forests, which I'm not gonna lie, can be kind of a pain in the ass. The levels here are kind of primitive. They're bounded by 2D textures of trees that were really dated looking, even for 2005. And they're also unrelentingly dark, which kind of sucks given how shitty our flashlight is. But running into and exploring the occasional abandoned house or structure out here and trying to look out for these spooky ass pale zombies in the fields is still very thrilling. You'll run through cemeteries, trails lit up by moody orange tiki torches, and even this part with a little lake that you have to cross in a boat. So it's not all bad by any means. It also leads us directly into my personal favorite part of the game. Eventually in the countryside, you will come across this giant orange Resident Evil ass mansion, which I just think switches things up so beautifully. Up until this point, the game has been pretty dark, but this mansion is as bright and colorful as can be, and it proves this game doesn't need to be pitch black to be unnerving. In fact, in some ways, this is one of the creepiest parts of the whole game. The paintings in this place used to freak me the fuck out as a kid, and I don't think I'm the only one. Eventually, David jumps down a fireplace to go underground, and we find ourselves back in another abstract dream sequence. And that finally leads to the game's ending, which, like I said, differs depending on which path you took in that subway tunnel. I'm gonna go in depth about the game's different endings in just a minute, but first, it's worth talking a little bit more about Afraid of Monsters gameplay. The gameplay of AOM is largely derivative of the original Half-Life, which means you'll be doing plenty of running, thinking, shooting, and living. The game does have a much heavier emphasis on resource management and survival horror, though. As for enemies, we've got these freaky fast creatures named Twitchers, these guys in wheelchairs, floating faces, hellhounds, holes in the ceiling that suck you up and not in the good way, whatever the hell this thing is, hand crabs, hardy har har, and the giant fucking face that is almost completely invisible and sucks to fight against, and if there was one thing I could change about this mod, it would be them. Thankfully, they're not very smart and they are pretty easy to cheese with the Magnum or Deagle, but I do still find them quite annoying. Speaking of the Magnum and Deagle, the weapons in this game are really satisfying and are also one of the main places of Freight of Monsters gameplay differs from half life, namely because you can switch out different weapons depending on your playstyle and preferences as you go. For example, for your pistol you can either have a Beretta, a Sig Sauer, or a full auto Glock with a switch straight out of an NBA Youngboy music video. You get the choice between the Deagle or this Magnum as I mentioned earlier, though I'd recommend sticking with the Deagle since I always seem to find more ammo for it. Despite the shotgun not actually being that powerful, I still find it incredibly satisfying to use. But if you don't, then you can always switch it out for this MP5 or even an Uzi later on. And you even get to pick out your own melee weapon. Starting out with this kitchen knife, but later getting the choice to switch to a hammer or even a fire axe. And by the way, the fire axe is fucking awesome. The game isn't just all slicing and gunning down enemies though. I mentioned earlier that there's a focus on survival horror as well, and as such, you'll regularly need to scavenge the map for items and buttons to help you progress. Whether it's finding keys to open doors, batteries to power your flashlight, ammo, or even ropes to climb fences and walls, you'll be spending a pretty decent amount of this game searching for items. Sometimes these items will be found laying in plain sight like the flashlight, other times you'll have to bust open boxes and trash cans or search car trunks to find them. And while I'm talking about the flashlight, I touched on this a little bit earlier, but it is probably my least favorite thing about this game other than the fucking face. Because it's the same flashlight from Half-Life 1, which is like a weird floating specter that flatly projects itself on any wall you look at two-dimensionally, and is kind of just awful. Given that this is a horror game and is therefore often very dark, and the fact that they've introduced a system where you can run out of batteries and be stuck in the dark if you use the flashlight too much, the flashlight sucking to use matters a lot more than it did in the original Half-Life. And I've seen this be a bit of a roadblock for people trying to get into this game. I don't blame them either. 
Anyways, now that I've covered the game's story, levels, and gameplay end to end, I think it's finally time to talk about the endings, because this nightmare journey that David embarks on does actually lead somewhere. If you haven't played Afraid of Monsters and really don't want to get spoiled on a 15 year old Half-Life mod, then I'd recommend you go to the timestamp seen on screen now. Alright, so, as I mentioned earlier, there's a point in the game where its levels branch out into different paths the player can choose from, and these each lead to one of three final sequences to close off David's story as he walks toward the light. And not only do these different endings impact which levels you visit and in what order, they each also recontextualize the events of the game, which I find to be really cool. You'll see what I mean in just a second. In the first ending, David's journey involves him stealing a jeep and crashing it in the woods. After making his way through this weird negative world under the mansion, he comes back to his senses in a cabin in the woods surrounded by corpses, as it's revealed that the monsters he'd been killing have all been hallucinations of real people, who he murdered in a sickening drug-induced mass shooting. We see a brief flash of him getting arrested, and then the credits roll. Banger outro music, by the way. In the second ending, things are a little more vague. David winds up visiting an even more nightmarish version of the hospital, completely covered in blood, and once the game ends, we see David being interrogated by a police officer, with no recollection of what happened during his drug-induced bender. And in the third, most brutal ending, you have to find this secret bar slash club building, which is one of my favorite locations in the whole game, and in the last shot of the game, we see a prison guard reading a newspaper with the headline, Psychotic Killer Claims Over 27 Victims. He goes to check on David in his cell, only to find that David has done something very not good to himself. Overall, these are all pretty morbid notes to end the game on. I've seen a lot of people say they saw the twist coming and that it was a bit cliche, but I first played this game as a naive kid, so it blew my mind the first time I beat it. I'm not entirely sure, but I think each of these endings are supposed to represent different levels of success David had on his shooting spree. In the second one, he kills the least people since he never left the hospital. In the first one, he kills many more and gets chased by the cops into the woods. And in the last one, he kills so many people that he just can't live with himself anymore once he comes back to his senses. It's honestly pretty dark for a story dreamt up by a 14 year old. However, if you happen to not like that the game ends with your player character dying or going to jail forever, you could always go for the secret ending, which can only be activated by the most inquisitive of players, who take note of these numbers shown throughout the game on notepads and write them all down, or just look up the full code online like a nerd. Upon going to this room near the end game and hitting out each of those numbers on the wall in the correct order, you'll open this door and activate the final, true ending of Afraid of Monsters. David winds up in the hospital again, not bloody this time, but still kind of messed up in its own way, and then eventually runs into this creepy ass monster named The Addiction, which takes on the appearance of what David would look like after asphyxiating and turning blue from an overdose. I always thought this guy was just so damn freaky. The way he looks and twitches as he moves used to seriously unnerve me when I was younger. The addiction is exactly what it sounds like, a literal physical manifestation of David's addiction to these pills. And just like how it's hard and hurts to kill an addiction in real life, it's hard to get this ending and David hurts himself every time he tries to attack this monster. Eventually, however, the addiction chases the player into this gothic ass room where they get their hands on a spear, which finally allows them to start damaging the addiction without hurting themselves, and is also where the addiction metaphor kind of falls apart. I don't think stabbing yourself with a spear is going to do anything for your real life opioid addiction. Anyways, once you kill the addiction, which takes fucking forever by the way, we finally come back to the real world to see David in a hospital bed after overdosing in the bathroom. He flatlines as the doctors curse the drugs that took his life. After a brief pause, however, David's pulse miraculously returns, and he's successfully resuscitated by the doctors. In this ending, David's nightmare trip was just that. A nightmare, not a mass killing spree of the innocent. And it's a nightmare that by being extra attentive to the game world and solving a pretty tricky mystery, we have successfully helped him escape. This is the most climactic ending by far. It's the most difficult to achieve, and it's meant to be reserved for only those who truly appreciated and paid attention to the game's world. And I think that is seriously awesome. Almost as awesome as the infinite ammo gun you unlock after you get this ending. The game ends with a bang no matter which path you take, and in my opinion is pretty exciting through it all. I know some people might find the fact that the narrative plays with the idea of you playing as a mass shooter to be a little insensitive, but try to remember that this game was made in 2005 by a Swedish 16 year old. Don't think about it too hard. Anyways, after its release, Afraid of Monsters Director's Cut became about as critically acclaimed as a free Half-Life mod can be. As I mentioned at the beginning, it was for a brief moment one of the most popular games on YouTube back in the olden days. Rumpel even says in an old YouTube video that the popularity of Afraid of Monsters got him a job at DICE, a Swedish subsidiary of EA, though this did not seem to drag him away from his passion for creating Half-Life horror mods at all. That brings us to the creation of Afraid of Monsters successor, Cry of Fear, which Rumpel spent a much longer time on, got much more help with, and which was overall much more ambitious. Cry of Fear 
later released in February 2012, five years after Afraid of Monsters director's cut, and was a lot different. It kind of gutted the Half-Life horror gameplay loop that AOM capitalized on, in favor of making what I would say is a more Silent Hill type game, with a heavier focus on inventory management and a much more involved plot. You might already know that Cry of Fear has an Afraid of Monsters hoodie in it that you can unlock for Simon, and it also has a secret joke ending where you find yourself in David's nightmares, and it gets revealed that David is the one who crashed his car into Simon and crippled him while he was on the way to Markland Hospital. What the fuck? Why? This is obviously not canon, but it is very funny. It's probably not fair for me to try to put one game above another, since while I do think AOM is a bit more respectful of the player's time, it's also less ambitious, and therefore there's really just not as much substance to criticize. Ultimately though, I've always found Afraid of Monsters to be more fun and replayable, and since it's the one I grew up on, I've always had more of a soft spot for it. This is surprisingly not where the Afraid of Monsters story ends, however. It turns out Rumpel wasn't quite done with David Leatherhoff after the release of Cry of Fear, since in December 2014, he publicly announced a game called Afraid of Monsters Dark Assistance. Dark Assistance was another remake of Afraid of Monsters, featuring touched up environments and remade models, as well as a co-op mode that would star these icon head guys. The idea was that once this remake was done, it would be published via the now defunct Steam Greenlight system, so that people could play it for free on Steam like Cry of Fear. Unfortunately, however, Dark Assistance was cancelled in 2016, apparently due to the fact that a strong community based around playing the game co cooperatively had already formed in the Half-Life 1 multiplayer mod Sven Co-op, and Rumpel figured it would be a better use of his time to move on to something else, which is fair enough. He had already remade the game once, after all. Rumpel did, however, eventually share an unfinished beta build of Dark Assistance online in October 2020. I tinkered around in it for the first time while working on this video. From what I can tell, there's new models for certain guns and enemies. Your movement speed is slower, but there's a new sprinting mechanic. There's completely new original music that's actually pretty good, you know, since he obviously wouldn't be able to publish on Steam with the copyrighted Aphex twin tracks included. And hey, would you look at that? There's even a slightly better flashlight. Slightly. It's still not great. And I'm honestly not the biggest fan of these new models either. The weapon animations feel a bit too modern and expressive in my opinion, and the enemies also look a little odd. Anyways, though Dark Assistance may have been cancelled, Afraid of Monsters multiplayer is still surprisingly popular, as it remains one of the most played custom campaigns in Sven Co-op. I've ran through it countless times with friends over the years, in fact I was even able to dig up these old screenshots of me playing it all the way back in 2012, and I'd honestly say it's a pretty fun way to enjoy the game. No, oh, Chungus. <laughs> Chungus. That's fucked. It even has its own hub world thing based on David's nightmare sequences where you can select which ending you want. It's cool. In fact, Sven Co-op is honestly one of the biggest parts of AOM's continued legacy and popularity online. It would be criminal for me to not mention Spike and Barley, a YouTuber duo whose co-op playthrough of the game where they were stalked and trolled by a server admin named Kockix, posing as the ghost of David and generally scaring the shit out of them. I grew up on these videos, and even coming back as an adult, there's still some gold in there. Rock, paper, scissors, go. <laughs> oh, holy shit! What? He was right next to you! <laughs> On the official end though, that's where our story ends, I'm afraid. After this Dark Assistance game was cancelled, Rumpel moved on and has, I guess, just been kind of tinkering for a couple years. I've heard that he's hinted at remaking both Cry of Fear and Afraid of Monsters, but who knows if anything will come of that. If Rumpel makes more horror games, I'll happily play them, but I feel like with Afraid of Monsters and Cry of Fear under his belt, encompassing three different games, one with a full co-op campaign, and even a cancelled project that he published online for people to do whatever they want with, in my opinion, the guy doesn't really owe the world anything else. He can rest if he needs to. And that brings us to today, 18 years after Afraid of Monsters director's cut, in the year of our lord, 2023. I hate to say it guys, but I don't think we're getting a sequel anytime soon. Not that the game needs or could even really have one. None of the endings leave much room for a continuation. And I guess Cry of Fear does serve as a pretty good spiritual successor, even if it's not really the same. As much as it would have been cool to see more of these awesome spooky gold source environments, it would surprise me to learn Rumpel has any interest in ever working on this shit he made as a teenager 20 years ago ever again. But that doesn't mean Afraid of Monsters should be forgotten. Over the years, it's left a deep impression on me and I'm sure tons of other people as well. This mod over-delivered, and is not only my favorite Half-Life mod of all time, but also maybe my favorite horror game of all time, period. Everything about it has stuck with me for a stupidly long time. I was genuinely probably like 8 years old the first time I played this game, and now I'm 20 and still talking about it. David Leatherhoff as a character lives in my head rent-free. Even though all he ever actually says in the game is this door is jammed and I can't stop taking these pills, and he doesn't even have a voice actor. 
Funny story, I actually liked David's design so much as a kid that I bought the Afraid of Monsters David Leatherhoff hoodie merch in high school and wore it damn near every day in the winter. That is until people started telling me that the angular font on the 45 sometimes kind of makes it look like the jacket had a swastika on it if it creased or if I slouched. Not exactly ideal for making friends. I don't normally get this personal on the channel, but I was even wearing this hoodie the night I asked a girl out in 10th grade and we're now living together and engaged. That is how long this game has been a part of my life. And come to think of it, with the EA45 text on the hoodie, I guess that kind of means me and Rumpel's high school romances, which happened over a decade apart, are kind of linked. Which is really strange to think about. Anyway, sappy bullshit aside, with most horror games I would say learning about how they work and how they were made usually makes them feel cheaper and less interesting. But for me, learning about the process that went into the creation of Afraid of Monsters has made me appreciate and enjoy the experience even more. I replayed all the ending paths while revisiting the game for this video, and it still feels just as dementedly wonderful and easy to get lost in as it did when I was a kid. I discovered tons of new areas I had no recollection of, which really shows how vast and replayable this game really is. And even all these years later, I still want more. There's just nothing that beats smashing a man in a wheelchair with a hammer so hard that he fucking disappears. I also don't think there's a Half-Life mod with a more grim dark ending out there. Even Cry of Fear doesn't end with the people. This game is Half-Life horror straight from the heart. A true classic with tons of soul and passion poured into it, one that I really wish was on Steam so more people could easily experience it. And even despite the fucking face, god-awful flashlight, and long boring intro, if you're willing to wait till you're home alone, turn off the lights, sit real close to the screen and pretend you're 2010 PewDiePie, Afraid of Monsters is still one of the best action horror experiences of all time. And in my opinion, it definitely deserves better than to live in Cryofear's shadow. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed, subscribe for more, and have a nice day.